Senator. Good afternoon. Welcome to Arkansas Society of Freethinkers Big Meeting. The Arkansas Society of Freethinkers is a nonprofit devoted to maintaining separation between religion and state, advocating a scientific and humanistic viewpoint, and improving the lives of non-believers. You can learn more about the Arkansas Society for Freethinkers at arfreethinkers.org or just getting to know the people around you. Um, the Arkansas Society for Freethinkers is a diverse organization with members who represent a wide range of opinions. The speakers who present at our big meetings do not necessarily represent the views of ASF or its individual members. Because we are a 501c3 organization, ASF cannot directly support candidates for public office. Sorry, Mr. President. Um, but we can advocate for causes such as separation of church and state, scientific literacy, societal progress, and truthful communication. Today, I would like to start with an introduction of uh, Bern Bradley, who will be giving us his free thought of the day. for the day is knowledge is power. It's attributed most often to Francis Bacon. Thomas Jefferson used it four times. That phrase was used four times in correspondence that he was uh, doing in the establishment of the University of Virginia. We have some uh, additions to that. Knowledge is power, but only if you know how to acquire it from The Economist, May 8, 2003. Bruce Lee said, Knowledge, is, knowledge will give you power, but character will give you respect. I, I think we need to add an addition to knowledge is power, and that is this. Knowledge is power if you do something with it. According to Douglas Brinkley in the book Silent Spring Revolution, in 1965, a scientific paper was developed and given to the Johnson administration that was all about pollution in our air, our water, and on our land. It came with a 23-page addendum that warned about the problems that were going to be caused by pumping so much carbon dioxide into the air, and at that time, those scientists warned that it would cause global warming. Folks, we knew in 1965 we had the knowledge in 1965 that this was going to be a problem. <coughs> and nobody did anything. Uh, you pretty much until Al Gore came out with a movie that won an Oscar. It's just one of those things. You can know all you, all you can. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't do something with it, it does, it's not very helpful to you. Thank you. Next presentation is going to be uh, the uh, skeptical sidebar, and I'm going to be doing that today. And I think there should be the beginning of the, the um, presentation up there. The skeptics' slogan, picks or it didn't happen. We traditionally rely on photography as proof, sometimes very solid proof. In court, you still have to authenticate a photograph. You have to bring someone in who will say, Yes, I saw this. This is a fair and accurate representation of what I saw, but we tend to believe pictures a whole lot more than we tend to believe words. So, I wanted to start with just having a busy adventure. Uh, things I did last year. Next, uh, I did a lot of traveling. Next, New Orleans. Next, Carnival in Rio. <laughs> At the beach. Go to Paris. Egypt. India, Moscow, Havana, a little break in Havana, New York. Now, the problem in New York was the caps were on strike when I was there. Uh, but anyway, next, the Caucasus, and next, where we got into a battle. And at the battle, and then after it, I was proclaimed Caesar. No, really, they, they meant 
They, they, they did a, a statue of me and everything. Okay, some of you may have become skeptical during that presentation. There, there I am making the news. You may remember that. No? And you say, Jerry, do you use Photoshop? No, I've never been able to use Photoshop. It requires artistic talent, and I don't have artistic talent. So, but I want to talk to you a little bit about where these pictures did come from. Not one of them was a real. They were all generated by artificial intelligence. Um, there are some clues about AI that you can look at. So look at, the, you've got these three pictures here. Now, next, next slide. Look here at the hand, Lane's hand. Well, that's a big problem with AI. AI hasn't quite figured out how to do hands. Another thing is that AI doesn't really understand clothes. So you get things like that tie. You see that the tie doesn't look like that you would normally wear a tie, or that you could even, could even wear a tie like that. Uh, next slide. And here I am standing by a statue of my great-great-uncle Olaf, who led a sit-on strike in the 19th century. No, I mean, the fact is, obviously this is fake, but the thing, if you look at it, look at the, look at the, the statue. He also kind of looks like me, which is another thing you have when you use something called a Laura, which is what we have with my pictures. I'll tell you how I got there in a minute. That sometimes you see it reappear, such as next. Who's better looking here, me or my twin brother or the man in the moon? In this particular picture, it generated two of me. Next. And, but you, there's another thing you've got to look at with AI to see if something's wrong. You see, I think the, the Rolling Stone proofreader may have missed something. And if you look more closely at the, at the um, words, it's all gibberish. One thing you get in a lot of AI-generated pictures is wording that's gibberish. It doesn't have any idea what it's saying. It's just taken many, many, many photographs and many, many images and run them all together and average them out. And that's what you get sometimes. Next. Can we believe our own eyes? Should we show this? Because Helena's there. I wasn't going to tell her about these adventures. But no, seriously, next. Uh, you know, sometimes they look pretty real. They're pretty convincing. But anyway, next. Uh, here's what you can do. You can do this for yourself. I've been experimenting with AI for about a year, maybe. And I've always done whatever was the free version until I got to Night Cafe. And this is a few bucks a month, but it's worth it because it was real easy. And uh, it's, it is nightcafe.studio. You get a not a com, dot studio. And uh, one of the things that you can do is you can put in about 30 pictures of anybody. I put, pick myself. It tells you don't use anybody's pictures without their permission. And another nice thing about this particular product is it won't generate what we call NSFW pictures, which is nice. But um, it does have some drawbacks, as you can see. I think if you look at those pictures, it kind of makes me look old. If you look tired, maybe it makes you look kind of fat. Oh, there may be a reason for that. Um, that's really all I wanted to show you, but I think real quickly, let's talk about the implications. Photographs for years have been the gold standard of what happened and what didn't happen. Now, we don't have that advantage anymore. That is the change. And so we're going to have to figure out how to deal with and how to adapt to that change. This wasn't skilled, talented um, work by a computer genius. This was me playing around with a product which is just right next to free. Anybody can do it. And there are product providers out there who don't have the NSFW restriction. Nobody really polices who, whose pictures go on there. So we have to be careful and, and realize that we just can't trust our own eyes anymore. We've got to be more skeptical than that. All right, at this point, I am supposed to launch into a short discussion to say that ASF free, helps free thinkers make friends and connections and ask everybody to introduce themselves today. I don't think that is, is necessary, but I also am going to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Kinko Ito. Dr. Ito is a professor of sociology at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. She has an impressively high rating on the Rate My Professor website. 
Dr. Ito teaches Introduction to Sociology, Japanese Culture and Society, Sociology of World Societies, Classical Sociological Theory, and Sociology of Organizations, and probably a few other things. Um, she received her MA and PhD in Sociology from Ohio State University. She's known not only nationally but internationally for her research in Japanese popular culture, including things like manga comics. Um, and uh, there were, I saw some pretty interesting titles. She's very widely published in academia in at least three languages that I know of. And uh, she uh, has uh, published a lot of, of groundbreaking books about Japanese women's comics and manga. Um, so, um, you know, she, she today is going to talk to you about the Ainu people of Japan, which is, it is an indigenous uh, group that live in Japan. Basically, all I know about them is I know that they have a language that can't be traced to any other language in the world. And it's things like that that, that uh, I know about. But I do need to tell you, in addition to the scholarly works, she has also published a few books to the general public that are available on the Amazon Kindle, which is what I use. And uh, since those are under a pseudonym, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that. But uh, most of them are popular books about the world travels because I think she's been to 82 countries. And uh, she is not only a world traveler, she's an expert on international cuisine. I know at least Japanese, Turkish, and Korean, and there may be more. Um, today, again, as I said, she's going to tell us about the Ainu indigenous people of Japan. And um, I'm going to uh, uh, stop now and introduce Dr. Kinko Kinko. and so on. Now, so Hokkaido used to be a very, very strategic place. Hokkaido did not belong to Japan before, but like in the 18th century, the Russians started to come down looking for ice cream ports. And then Americans, British, French, and a lot of people were interested in Hokkaido because of its strategic location. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about the native people of Japan who are from there and also their ancestors lived in the southern Saharan and Creole Islands and northern part of Honshu as well. And, um, you know, Jerry's presentation was just so appropriate as a prelude to my presentation because you see what you see and you believe what you believe, basically. So if you haven't been to any place like Hokkaido, and then I would say, imagine the Ainu people. <laughs> you know, unless you have a very, very flexible, fan, you know, fantasy kind of mind person, you know, you never ever can imagine. So I think it's very important to show how the Ainu people in general look <coughs> now. So I'm going to show my uh, short presentation, which is, um, have you heard about the Ainu? And there are two actually, have you heard about the Ainu on YouTube? The first one is 78 minutes, so it's a little bit too long, but the second one is 31 minutes, and I think you can get a very good introduction to the Ainu people, what they look like, and as you might say, just like we don't see many pure-blooded Native American people here in the United States, there are not many uh, pure-blooded Ainu people anyway these days, and because of intermarriages, some Ainu people look more like the Ainu, but the others look more like Japanese, but some other Ainu people may look like my Italian friend from Sardinia or a man from Polynesia. So there's a wide variety of looks among the Ainu people today. But as you see in my first um, film here, I think you can get some kind of visual images, what kind of life they live. 
and so on. So let's get started with the, uh, my documentary film. Have you heard about the Ainu? Uh, toward better understanding and world peace. いつもまでが差別用語と愛の人に対して愛の愛のって言ってるけどさ本来の意味するところは愛の人の人間だからね嬉しくも知り胸を打たれ怯ったを打たれあれるよねで嬉しくも知りたら世界の国々世界の人々
、日本の中でもまだアイヌはこんな、うん、あの現代風な暮らししていると思ってない人がたくさんいるみたいだからね。そうそうです。はい。これはもう認識不足中が勉強不足中がね、うん。みんな知らないから。うん。うんだから多分こういう服を着て地底に住んでるって思ってるんですよ、うん、皆さんね地底,、うん、地底に暮らしてるのとかって聞かれるっていうんだからねそんだけまた分からない人間がいっぱいいるっていうさ、うん、私ね三重県に娘のとこ行ったんですよね、うんはい、これであのラーメン食べるかいって言うんでラーメン屋さん行ったの、はい、そしたらそこのママさんがね、はい、ちょっとね北海道のアイヌの人はね熊と一緒に暮らしてるんだってねって、うん、そういうのびっくりしたの私、うん、でうちの娘がね、はい「うちの母さんアイヌなんだよ」って,、はい、って言ったらそのママさん「嘘だ」って言うんだわ、はい、ね母さん綺麗だからアイヌじゃないって<笑>アイヌって言うと、うんその口の染めた口の染めね染めた人がアイヌだと思ってんのあああのーうん、ここに入れ墨をしてた入れ墨をしてる人、うん、それからひげの子を伸ばしてる人がアイヌだと思うんで、はい、それで「私いや私はね本当アイヌなんですよ」って、はい、それでアイヌの講師をしてるのでね、ええ、あの本当にあのアイヌなんだけどママさんちょっとね古いですよったの私。今ね、うん、アイヌって言ったって土台付きのね立派な家に入って、うん、言ったら悪いけどアイヌにはね古事記がいないんだいっていないの本当にえどうしてですかいないよみんなも自分のこと守ってるから、うん、アイヌの古事記なんてどこ行ったっていないよって言ったの、うん、そしたらママさんびっくりしてね「うん、いや母さんごめんねごめんね」って私勉強不足だったねって言ってねそし、うん、たらあのうちの娘と友達みたいなそのママさんがね「豊、うんうん、ちゃんごめんね」ってうちの娘に謝ってね、うん、いただから本当に全然わからない人はあいぬあいぬったりね、うんうん、それこそさ山のそういうのと一緒に暮らしたりなんかしてるみたいな感じ。うんでも腹立つ少しの間腹立ったけどまあ怒ることもないし、うん、あこの人も勉強不足なんだからと思ってね、うん、そう思ってね。うん犬はその徳川幕府にさ「北海道に来てください」と頼んだ覚えもね賃貸もしてね徳川幕府は北海道の資源を求めてくる帝政都市は不登校を求めて南下政策をやるでしょだけどその時すでに我々の先祖は北海道に住んでるんですよ。人間として我々は変わってなかったってことだな。人間としているんだら、当然我々もその時に、その、土地の問題なのもに関わりなくなった。なんだ関わってね。小しり目なしだとか、着者縁のなんとかいろいろあるかもしれないけど、その戦だからやっぱり、当然勝ち負けの結果出るんだけど、歴史を歪曲することなく、正しくできる認識を持ちたいと。文化を正しくお互いに共有してさ、そのご理解で進みたいというのが今の自分の気持ち。って書いたりすればああいうのは女もろいから預かってで我が子と同じ差別なく育ってでだからそれで結婚したらその人はしゃもであるけども実際は父はしゃもでもああいうのに育ったりとかまるっきりああいうのの習性
ああいうのを全部身につけているから自分しゃもだよっていう人は一人もいないなうん分かった分かったでも顔はしゃもなんだよね顔はしゃもでもうん、うん、へえだからね、うん、なんでそんなにね、うん、子供を人にくれるのかって言ったらさ、うん、昔はおいシャモだって困ったらどうしようもないんだわ、うんね、殺すわけにもいかないからくれちゃうわけだ、うんうん、で,でみんなあの本州に帰ったんですか子供を置いていや本州ってまた次の仕事場さ移るのさ、うんうん、もう自分の子供を前とっかよねくれ,、うん、くれなかったら自分は生活できないんだよ親自身がシャモだってうん、うんうん、そうだろさシャモだってどんどん入ってきたって、うん、ねそそれこそ家一つもないやつらが来るんだからさ、うんうん、だからね困ることはもう確かなの、うん、結局ああいうのね何ぼ、うん、ああいうのが困ったっつっても、うん、やっぱりおい、えー、家を持って、うん、そこ生活してるんだから、うん、そこへくれちゃうわけだうん、うん、じゃあそのああいうの家族子供がいっぱいいても、うん、シャモの子を、うん、だからね自分で子供二23人おっても、ええ、ねっシャモの子供をもらって一緒に育てる、うんうん、じゃあそのシャモの子たちはアイヌ語しゃべって、うん、アイヌのお祭りをやって結局もう言葉一つじゃあそのアイヌの家族子供がいっぱいいても、うん、シャモの子を、うん、だからね自分で子供二23人おっても、ええね、シャモの子供をもらって一緒に育てる、うんうん、じゃあそのシャモの子たちはアイヌ語しゃべって、うん、アイヌのお父さんをアイヌに持ちお母さんが和人でアイヌに育てられた方だったんですけど、うんうんうん、アイヌとして一番苦労されたことはどういうことですかアイヌとして苦労されたまあ,あの私は相手の。差別的なことを思い出したくもないからあんまり言っていないけれどもこの間和信さんがそのポロチスで言ったあいの学校へ行って悪いことをしたのは和人の子の方なんだけども先生自体がもう、うん、悪いのはあいの生徒だ子供だという。決めつけがあったこれは鈍たにお幸ない触れないのみならず私の土地でもありました、うん、で私は小学生時代でもねそして先生の差別も確かに体験してるけど同志の意識が私には随分あったのかな同じアイヌの指定型仲間喧嘩でして。いいじめられていると自分がそのあなたに当事者でないのに仲間の二人アイヌの少年がいじめられたら勝手に私がやっつけてやったという<笑>エピソードもあります。学校の先生はアイヌの子供にこうつついて「ほらやめろ」ってやると相手は。こっちが悪者だと思うから余計道になってまた何かの時に、えー、繰り返しそういういじめに遭いました。にまあ五年生になってから今度はあの校長先生が変わったんでその変わった校長先生がまたとてつもないいい先生だったもんだからそれからはそういう。差別も受けなかったしでみんなあ生徒全部仲良くうやりましたま
スコットランド行かれたでしょ、うん、その時は自分はやっぱり日本人って思ったのかそういう海外へ行くとさ、うん、その意識がすごくよみがえるものだわ、うん、でもピラドに住んでる限りは自分はああいうのっていうアイデンティティで行くと、うん、そういうことなんですよね、うん、そのこと、うん、だから外国に行く場合は日本人っていうのとアイヌっていう二つのアイデンティティーズを持っていくっていうことですかたとえハーフといえどもね、うん、アイデンティティは違うからね要するに血がどうのこうのじゃなくってさ言語とか、うん、食習慣とか伝統とかで、うん、それでそのアイヌになるっていうんだったら歌いでいいって話だったでしょそうですそうです、うん、私の母はさ、うんあの血液は入ってないわけでしょ。うん。うん、今何を飲んでらっしゃるんですか。今。あ,あ,あのこれ以上酔っ払ったら困るから、もうお茶と白湯と合わせて。う<笑>ん。これで映すとさ、酔っ払わないのって世界中に広まるからね。<笑><笑>これがアイヌ、ネノアイヌだって言っちゃいかんぞ。美<笑>味しいですか？焼酎。<笑>焼酎。辛<笑>い。ケラン、ケラン。<笑>これいくぞ。天国地獄のごちそうないよって。お酒？うん。ケラン、ケラン。<笑>これはね、あのマタンブシと言って、はい、うん、ハチマキなんですよ。はい、で、これはね、うんとちょっと飾りなんだけど、レクトゥンペって言ってね。レクトゥンペ。うん。本当はこうずっとこう玉のついたものを下げなきゃならないんだけど、これをすることによってそれをしなくていい。うん。うん。で、この着てる着物は、チカルカル。チカルカル。チカルカル。チカルカル。うん。これは。私は私、はい、私が作った着物ですよって。え、ちょっと本当にお使いになったんですか。そう。へえ、うん。まあ刺繍ですよね、それ。そう。うん。どれくらい時間かかりましたか。三ヶ月。へえ。はい。で、これはあの一応反転。はい。うん。反転はどういう時に着るんですか。え、普通男の人でも女の人でもちょっとした。うんあのお話とかいろいろするときにちょっとだけ着るものはこの、うんうん誰に習ったんですか自然的さ、うん、で孫婆さんいたからさ、ええ、孫婆さんがねもう専門にああいうのを使うさ、はい、で俺にすると「何そんな言葉俺の分かるように言えき」ってな「<笑>そんなこと言ったって俺これしかできないもの」ってああいうのばかりやるや。<笑>じゃあアイヌ語で喋れるんですか今でもあるある程度なうん、うん
。私はピリカメの子です。金はなくね、ポンのポンのは痛くてって,って。<笑><笑>今何とおっしゃったんですか。<笑>今何とおっしゃったんですか。今何ちった俺、うん。うん。なんかポンのポン。金はなくねっていうのはね、うん、俺はっていうことだった。はい。はいうん、ね。ちょべっとぐらいはね、喋れるよということを言った。はい、わかりました。和、う、之、ん、さんは今習ってらっしゃるんですよね。いや、俺はほとんど喋れないな。いらっしゃらなくてかな,かな。そんなことありえない。うん、<笑>よく何日本語でやってもなんでも言葉は悪いあの成長する始まりで悪い言葉から覚えるとかあるでしょ。<笑>はい。そしたらね、ええ、その中の一つに、はい、よくその俺ら子供の頃年寄りいや年寄りってある年配の人らが言い合いしてる言葉の中に「はい、エコロペさんけねかむれ」ってこういう言葉があるんだよ。うん、な、うん、これは何,何の意味だと思うわ<笑>からないな。あんな、うん、あ俺解説してるか、うん、はいじゃあ解説お願いします。あんねうんエコロベっていうのはね、お前のものっちゅうんだよ。お前のもの。うん、いやいや、ここのことを言うの。わか,か,かった。お,お前のもの、ね。女のものだったら、サマンペでしょう。いや、サマンペもだけど。<笑>エコロペ三景ね、かむれっていうこと。うん。俺のやつはかぶせれっていう。うん、ええ。あ、楽しいな。国家の利権主義を主張するということが私は嫌なんだろうなと思うからさだから今苫小牧でそのここの富川も言った苫小牧にエスペラント語の部会ができてるから本当にエスペラントの言葉をさ何が一生懸命考えてやるという共有意識を持ったらもっといろいろ。世界的な紛争の問題の解決になるんじゃないかと、うん、私は思う。ハルくんだいぶ昔から思ってる。うん、さあ、宗教紛争中のはさ、うん、やっぱり本当に利害を超えた言葉が必要だと私は思ったんだ。うん、で、同じ言葉をお話ししても分かり合えないっていう時もあるからね。うん、だから言葉はある,ある程度手段だけど、うん、私は気持ちも大切だと思うよ。気持ちそうそう、うん、分かったし、うんね、だから私は、うん、あの風貌として、うん、逆な変,変な差別も受けたこともあるけども、うん、この魂の、うん、どこどこ<笑>どこになりますか魂は左かな右かな<笑>魂はあいの字<笑>うん鳥のそのアイヌ語とはやっぱり他のとこと違うんですか「いらからって」とかって私らは言うしょしばらくですねとかね「静、う、内、ん」とか「裏かのたり」「いかたい」「いかたい」でしょ「いかたい」たいうん「じ、はい、さん」っていう人がね「静内」行ったんだとさで裕二さんが「いらからって」って言ったら「いかたい」っていうのが「えぱたい」って聞くああ「<笑>えぱたい」ってどういう「えぱたい」「お前はバカだな」って。<笑>せっかく挨拶したのにねもうそう言われてもねもう本当に悔しかったって、うん、だけど今度後で説明されたら、うん、気持ちだいぶ落ち着いたけど最初だったらもう悔しかったって言って、うん、で今ね現代の日本で学校でいじめにあったりとか、うん、引きこもりになったりとかそういう若い人たちいっぱいいますよね、うん。そういう人たちに今までずっとアーニュとして生きてきてきた経験からなんかこういうふうに生きてほしいとかこういうふうにしたらいいっていうアドバイスとかありますか。やっぱりね、あの自信を持ってやっぱりやるべきことはやっぱり一生懸命やらなきゃということはアイヌに生まれてアイヌの系統であることを隠そうとしなきゃならんという気持ちをなんとか。消さなくちゃそれにはやっぱりね人と同じか人にくっついてやるんじゃなく自分が努力というかアイデ,ィア,イディアを出してア
アイヌとしてあの育って一番良かったことは何ですかまあ、アイヌとして育って今が自分で一生懸命勉強して、うん、今アイヌ語の先生として皆さんに大事にしていただき可愛がっていただいているのでそれが一番良かったんじゃないの、うん、今が一番幸せじゃないのもう85歳だよ<笑>これからどのぐらい生きていけるっていうああもう95でも105でもいけると思いますよ<笑>そう85歳うん、だって幸子さんいないと盛り上がらないもん、うん、踊りとか歌とかまあ今のところねまた私いなかったらいないなりにまた若い人たちも勉強してるからうん、うん どうしたらみんなが人類仲良くお互い理解し合って仲良く生きると思いますかだからねまあこれはなかなか簡単に生きれないけれどもまあ最近においては、ましては国連で四十六箇条もね人権宣言なされてるでしょそれということはもう<
And uh, surely enough, uh, Mr. Nabesawa, who was in his blue jacket, and he said that it's very important that we need to talk from heart to heart, and we need to um, discuss matters and so on to keep work this. He passed away in 2019. So uh, the older generation who experienced discrimination and prejudice and everything, they were dying off, and that is why I focused on the elderly. However, last summer I went to Hokkaido again and I started filming the new generation. So uh, there's going to be another movie hopefully coming out this year or early next year. Are there other ethnic groups like that in Japan similar to the circumstances that I mean? Like yes. The Okinawans? Yes. Maybe? Yes. And actually, Okinawans and the Ainu are kind of related. Um, a lot of people, I don't know much about um, genetic kind of things, but Japan used to be the part of the continent, East Asian continent. And then Japan gradually, you know, Sea of Japan used to be a lake. But because of the movement over so many years, Japan, were, Japan was isolated from the continent. And then the people up in north, in Hokkaido and in Okinawa, in the south, they were further isolated from the mainland Japan, Honshu. And there were lots of Chinese and Korean people who came to Japan as migrants and then they mixed with the Japanese people. But the people in Hokkaido and Okinawa, they were kind of isolated, so they keep more genetic traits from old Japan. And actually, my host father, Cass, said, when he visited Okinawa, he felt that there were lots of people who looked like him there, you know. And Okinawa said the same thing. Well, we, we kind of look alike, don't we? So, uh, Okinawans and the Ainu, and then there are a couple of other ethnic groups like Chinese, Koreans, and uh, other people in Japan. But they are minorities. And the interesting thing is, uh, when we talk about democracy, we're always counting numbers. And that is unfair. So uh, if the majority of us said that this microphone is yellow, then it's yellow. That's, you know, the danger of democracy. That's what Mr. Nabisawa taught me. So if the majority of us call this yellow, and nobody says, no, it's black. But a lot of times, because like 99% of us said that this is black, I mean, yellow, so it is yellow. And the voices of the majority of people always count because of the number. But that shouldn't be it. That's basically what's the message from Mr. Nabesawa. That is, we need to discuss, we have to learn the other sides, and we have to be fair to everybody. If there are any more questions, let me know. I'll bring the microphone to you uh, so that people watching uh, the video will be able to. Uh... Yeah, since you know the video is fresh in our mind, so if you have any kind of questions, yes? So I've always seen how uh, I know had women had mouth tattoos mm -hmm. and had beards. Um, you had none of that. And no. Many people think you had hair. In Japanese culture, generally, tattooing is associated with the games. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that something that's been a problem in in being able to get into the Japanese? Well, yeah, actually the Japanese government prohibited the Ainu men from wearing earrings and, and the women from wearing tattoos around their mouth. Like the tattoos around their mouth is, has a meaning. That means that the person, a woman who has this big tattoo, she's a mature woman ready to get married. So it was part of the customs and manners. But as I said, Hokkaido didn't belong to any countries before, and the Russians were coming, and the Japanese government had to make Hokkaido their territory right away. So with the colonization board in the 19th century, the Ainu people had to go through assimilation policies. You know, They had to change their names to Japanese sounding names. And Ainu kids were sent to schools to learn Japanese and Japanese customs and so on. And Ainu people had to change their hairdo, okay? And men could not wear earrings anymore, or women could not do the tattoos and so on. So 
you know, one person's uh, treasure is somebody else's trash, you know, something like that, right? Whatever we consider very important that is limited to our own group, and then there's some other people may not consider it as appropriate. So when we talk about like I know men have to wear a Japanese hairdo, and then even nowadays, like a lot of uh, African American females, they tell me that they cannot wait, you know, wear braids, you know, if they want to at the workplace because the workplace says that there is a code for hair, something like that. So this kind of thing keeps going on and on and on. And uh, part of the reason why they have to stop these practices is because the government prohibited it. And there are penalties for that. And we're going to talk more about that in the slides, OK? OK. Any other quick question? OK. If you don't have it, then let's go to the um, presentation there. Oh my gosh, I can't read. The letters are so small, but anyway. So, and this goes back to your question first. That is, a lot of people think that Japan is a uh, one race kind of country. Now, uh, Prime Minister Nakasone, he was a Prime Minister when Ronald Reagan was the president, right? So Nakasone, when he visited the United States, he talked to the president and the press that, you know, Japan does not have problems with you know, busing or, you know, minorities or all this kind of stuff, you know, because Japan is a one monoracial kind of country and we don't have to put up with all these different minority groups. So the educational records are pretty good and the divorce rates are good, blah, 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 blah. And then the Ayu people protested. That is, no, Japan is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial country. There are minorities in Japan. But you see the Prime Minister Nakasone kind of dismissed it. No, we are all Japanese, and that is why we don't have problems with education or employment and blah, blah, blah. So uh, this is the first thing that I want you to know, that Japan is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial countries, and the Ainu people, the percentage is very, very small. And one of the reasons is that they do not need to identify themselves with the Ainu people. Like for example, when you are born here in the United States, you are entered into the birth certificate kind of system. But in Japan, we have family registry. So the name of the father, the mother, the addresses, and so on. But there are no racial kind of column that you have to put that information on. So um, there are you know, Chinese people and Korean people and the Filipinos and other people in Japan. And uh, the numbers are not small when you look at the numbers, you see that? But they are supposed to be like about 24,000 um, Ayu people in Japan altogether, but the number cannot be counted on because people who don't want to identify themselves as Ayu, they'd rather not. And it's because of the prejudice and discrimination. So the same thing here, you know, a lot of um, people you know, do not come out as LGBTQ at work if they don't want to because there could be some kind of disadvantage to it because, you know, people may think or do all this kind of stuff, which is interesting, isn't it? Anyway, so let's go to the next. Um, okay, now. So who are the Ainu? And then I think some of you already got the idea from my video presentation. I really first to humans or a man or father and so on. And um, they are the indigenous people of Japan, as I said. Okay. But nowadays, modern Ainu live in just any other Japanese people's house. I mean, they don't live in a thatched roof house, which is called Chise. And actually, the Japanese uh, fire department said that you cannot live in Chise for the fire prevention reasons, because Chise is made of natural materials. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, so I think you already know where Japan is located. Okay, it is... Uh, very close to China, okay, close from China, and the ancestors of the island lived in the Kuril Islands, that is the islands between Hokkaido and the Kamchatka Peninsula, and also half of Saharan. And as you all know, the Kuril Islands and Saharan, they're all Russian territories now, and Hokkaido and the northern parts of uh, in Honshu. Okay, next. Okay, so the Ainu people, 
So on the left hand side, you can see Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Kayano. And Mr. Kayano is the first Ivan man who ever was elected to the National Assembly in the 1990s. And actually, by the time I went to Hokkaido, Mr. Kayano was deceased, but his wife, Reiko Kayano, made me a very special uh, potato dish. Boiled potatoes with butter and salt, and oh my gosh, that was so divine. And she also offered me green tea, and I interviewed her a little bit. Now, on the right hand side, these are the more uh, traditional or older kind of images of the eye. And you can see the tattoos around the mouth, and also the man has a long beard. Okay. So, they, most Ainu people look more like uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Kaina on the left hand side. Okay. Now, so the Ainu people, okay. <laughs> I can't really read it, so. Uh, so, the Ainu people have been intermarrying with the Japanese people for a long, long time, okay? So, um, and that is the reason why the majority of their people today do not like anything like Ainu anymore. So, as Mr. Nabisawa was talking about, um, his mother was a non-Ainu Japanese, Wajin, and his dad was an Ainu, and that is why he called himself 50% half. <laughs> okay. But the interesting thing is, the Ainu are a racial group and also an ethnic group. So his mother, who was born a you know, traditional Japanese, but she was adopted by the Ainu couple, so she spoke Ainu language and um, practiced Ainu customs and manners and so on. So that constitutes her as an Ainu as well. So when we talk about like Jewish people, okay, so some Jewish people, they had their mothers who were Jews, or some other people may have, you know, uh, converted to Judaism, and then you can theoretically call yourself a Jew because you practice Judaism, something like that. So our identity is kind of uh, very, very flexible, and according to Nabisawa, as you saw in the video, he goes abroad, and when he's invited as a guest lecturer or something, a lot of times he feels like he is an Ainu, but at the same time he has a Japanese passport, so he has kind of double identity. Okay. No, it's so hard to read. Okay. So, can you read? Can you? Yes. Yeah. Today's Ainu are totally assimilated to the Japanese way of life, just like anyone else. Yeah, so we talked about the house, and they drive cars, they use computers, cell phones, and so on, yes. Shiro Kaigano, head of the Ainu party, said, we live in a modern house with many amenities. We use cell phones and computers. We drive cars and trucks and eat Japanese food. Yeah, I just said that, didn't I? Yeah, I just, I'm just reading what's here. Yeah, I can kind of see them, but not. Okay, the other one says, Hiroko Fujito, an Ainu cultural advisor wants to preserve their traditional culture and promote understanding. She teaches about the Ainu way of life at schools and universities, as well as offering lessons on Ainu designs, embroidery, etc. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. And this is the woman that I interviewed and I filmed this this last summer. And uh, so she's in her 40s, and then she's very proud of her Ainu heritage and. Um, I went to Kyoto to attend the Stanford University's Japan Center's um, seminar, and she was one of the guest speakers, I was one of the guest speakers, and uh, so we hit it off, and Hiroko invited me to come to her house and live for you know, several days, which was quite interesting. So Hiroko, uh, as an Ainu woman, has a very different philosophy from the rest of the the um, Japanese people, and uh, it's quite interesting because the Ainu are very close to nature, and then Hiroko is growing vegetables and uh, indigo and other plants, and she called these plants my children, <laughs> and she talks to them, and then uh, she talks about how they're important, you know, like everything that exists in the universe has a function that was given by God and that is why we have to cherish them, we should never ever waste them, and so on. So it was kind of um, eye-opening 
you know, thing for me. You know, I, I try to conserve energy. I try to be good for ecology, you know, and I actually assign a lot of ecological homework to my students, actually a little work. But Hiroko kind of uh, is a very good example, a kind of leader in that development. Okay. Yes. So today's I'm a little just like any other people. <laughs> I think we talked about that. The contemporary I enjoy modern technologies and gadgets. They use computers and cell phones, drive cars, and fly when they travel abroad. Yeah, and um, Hiroko wants to come to the United States, and then says, sure, but guess what the problem is? She hates airplanes. She says she's scared of airplanes. I said, well, you know, maybe you can take a ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. The Ainu today in Japan no longer live in this kind of traditional Ainu house called Chisa. Yeah, and that's, you see the thatched roof? And then inside there is a fireplace, and that's where they cook. And um, it's very old, old kind of uh, house. And then uh, my host father, Kaz, used to tell me that, like sometimes when the the wind blows and then the snow comes in, they have to put newspapers and the papers on the wall to keep the cold air drifting into the house. And usually it is one room too. The Ainu people still wear elegant Ainu clothing and headdress at religious ceremonies and cultural festivals to preserve their traditions. The intricate designs of the handmade clothing with patchwork and embroidery are traditionally transmitted from the mother to the daughter. The materials for the clothing include tree fibers and cotton. Mm -hmm. And I think you remember Mrs. Kibata Sachiko talking about her Madame Fushima head, head band and also this kind of choker for her. Um, neck and then also the clothing and so on. So not only the Ainu women, but a lot of non-Ainu Japanese women are taking lessons in embroidery and making Ainu kimonos. <laughs> and uh, one of the students, a uh, Japanese woman, taught me that I really like the Ainu people, the Ainu culture and so on, and making things like Ainu kimono makes me feel like I'm one of them, in, which is interesting, isn't it? And you saw the sapante, uh, which is a headdress. And um, usually when you wear this uh, sapante, it is for the rituals, religious rituals in sacred occasions and so on. And as you might remember, Kuku-chan, who did this Ainu sword dance for winning the war or going into war and stuff like that. So he's a wood carver and he had a souvenir shop. So in 2012, I visited his shop and I interviewed him for like three hours, which is a long time. But he didn't have many customers, so he had a mall because, you know, I was like 30, 40 years younger than he and I was totally interested in his life and so on. So he really enjoyed talking with me. But at the very beginning, he was a little bit nervous because I was a professor who teaches sociology in America. And then he could barely graduate uh, from uh, high school. He was a little bit nervous about me. And um, so anyway, so I said, well, he's a little bit nervous. I know that he's tense. But anyway, I mentioned about the items on the wall that he was selling, I know items. And I thought, you know, I really needed to break ice. So I said, oh, that is chicken calpe, that is this and that. And then I mentioned, uh, you know, sapampe, the headdress, okay? A headdress looks like a boat like that, okay? So, but I used the word sapampe. Okay, that's sapampe, and I was so proud. I wanted to show off to Hukuchan that, yes, I do know i culture, and that is called sapampe. And Hukuchan rushed, and then I said, what, what did I say? And then Hukuchan said, a young lady like you should not use that word. Word? I said, what do you mean by that? It's sapampe. And then he said, no, it's sapampe. Sapampe is a headdress. And then, so I asked him what sapampe meant. And he said, it looks like that shade. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it refers to women's private part. And that is why he blushed, because he did not hear that word for some time, because he was in his 70s, obviously. You see that? 
But that was a great icebreaker because after that he felt very, very comfortable because we laughed so hard. But I'll never ever forget that incident, you know. It's Sapampe, you may want to remember, because you can make the same mistake when you go to Hokkaido to show up your knowledge, you know, and accidentally say that word. <laughs> Anyway, so let's go to the next one. The history of the Ainu in Japan. The Japanese archipelago was connected to the Asian continent a very long time ago. Humans came to Hokkaido about 30,000 years ago. The Jovanian period, 6 BC to 3 BC, uh, or, or 6th century BC to 3rd century BC, saw the rise of a primitive hunting, fishing, and gathering society. Rice cultivation was started during the Yayoi period, 3rd third century BC to 3rd century AD, after rice was brought by the migrants to the continent. The Ainu in Hokkaido and the Ryukyu in Okinawa kept more distinctive characteristics of the Jolong people due to the distance from the mainland where intermarriages with people from the Asian continent take, took place. Yeah, did I explain this already? I did, right? Okay, let's go to the next one then. Between the 5th and 6th century, the people in the mainland Japan adopted many aspects of Korean and Chinese cultures, such as Chinese characters, art, agricultural methods, crafts, and textiles, while the Ainu still practiced hunting, fishing, and gathering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, and let's just stop there, because uh, this is kind of an ancient, long time ago history, but my topic today is modern, I mean, history. So we're going to skip like the 12th, 13th, and 15th, 16th centuries, and let's go to the um, the next one. I think the 19th century. So we're going to jump, okay, several hundred years, and let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah, Hokkaido colonization war. So now I'm just going to summarize, okay, Jerry. Um, so basically, as I told you, that Japan had to claim that Hokkaido belongs to Japan to be at the world scene, you know, to become world power and so on. So, Hokkaido Colonization Board was basically a death sentence to many Ainu people. So, a lot of Japanese, non-Ainu Japanese started to migrate to Hokkaido and take their land. And the interesting thing about land was, the Ainu people did not have a notion of the ownership of private land. The land belonged to everybody. I guess there's a song that this land belongs to everyone, you know. So they did not have the notion of the private land ownership. So a lot of Dharma people lost their land, okay. And of course the Japanese government took the better land for the Japanese immigrants in Hokkaido, obviously. So the Hokkaido Colonization Board Okay, it impacted the Ainu children as well because the children were sent to boarding schools to learn Japanese and Japanese customs and so on. And uh, one of the things about uh, Hokkaido colonization board that was really, really bad for the rape of Ainu culture was the assimilation policies. And I think I mentioned it to you, right? You have to change your name to Japanese name, and then you have to wear Japanese hairdo, you know and speak Japanese and um, eat Japanese food and follow Japanese traditions and customs and manners and so on. So the, as far as the religion is concerned, Ainu religion is very similar to Shintoism. Shinto is also an indigenous animistic kind of religion and they believe in eight million gods or kamis and the reason is everything that uh, exist in the universe, okay, they are given to us and uh, each of them have, is a kami or kami god. So they're each of them, whatsoever exists is sacred. So the trees, rocks, sky, cloud, animals, and human beings and so on. And I believe in the same thing. So the Japanese government would go to the island land and then they would cut trees without the island's permission or they would uh, tell the island people to cultivate, you know, uh, vegetables and uh, grains and so on. See, island people were originally hunting and gathering people, 
and they would, you know, uh, fish salmon, or they would, you know, kill deer, and so on, because salmon and deer were their staple food. So the Japanese government prohibited fishing of salmon in rivers. That's their staple. And then the Japanese government prohibits them, you know, um, hunting deer by using their own traditional animals and stuff like that. So when the government says you cannot get your staple food, what is the message there? What's the message there? Yeah, death to the iron, basically, because they cannot eat the staple food. So, and then the interesting thing was, I was at the museum, and then this guy was kind of showing me around, and then he said, you know, saying, you know, to your staple food, you can catch these things, that means death to the Ainu, and when he said, just said that, he had tears welling up in his eyes, and um, I was very touched by that, you know. But that's basically what it was. Just for the colonization board, okay? So, uh, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, so can you read the ears, Chair? Yes, the modern history of the Ainu in Japan. 1889, the Japanese government issued the Hokkaido Former Arig uh, Aborigines Protection Act concerning the status of the Ainu. The act included assimilation policies, confiscation of land, destruction of I the Ainu way of life, the Ainu were given Japanese citizenship. For example... Yeah, just a minute. So, the Ainu were automatically given Japanese citizenship. What does that mean? That is, Hokkaido belongs to Japan. Hokkaido is Japanese territory. Why? Because these people are Japanese. So that was a kind of tricky way to claim that land. You say, for example, is it Iomante or Iomante? Iomante. Iomante, mm -hmm. a religious ceremony of sending the spirit of a bear to heaven, was prohibited because the government considered it barbaric to kill a bear for the ritual. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so what the Ainu people do is, okay, Iomante is actually a ceremony of sending off the spirit of bear to the, up there, in the heaven, and the reason is Kimun Kamui, or uh, bear god, Kimun Kamui was supposed to be the highest god among both these hierarchies. So they would try to please the Kimun Kamui up there so that the Kimun Kamui can bring down all these nice things, okay, the meat, okay, and the food and everything else like that. So they would catch a little cub. Okay, when they got, get out of the uh, hibernation. Usually the cubs are with the mother bear, so they would get the small cub, and then an Ainu family would adopt the cub and raise the cub with respect and with care and everything. That is, the cub is going to be okay, given as the kind of sacrifice, as a gift to Kimun Kami. So the, the cub would... Uh, sometimes drink human milk if it needs to be and then they give you nice food and everything and kept in the she said the house and then later on one later on when the cow is very big then they're kept in a special kind of cage until the day of Iomante. So Iomante is a festival when the Ainu people gather for a couple of days there are lots of feasts and dancing and singing and then the highlight of that was to kill the bear, which is now a big bear, and with an arrow, and send the spirit of that bear to heaven so that the bear can tell what kind of people are the Ainu. They treat you with respect, they feed you, and they treat you nicely, and so on. So the bear, the spirit, can tell uh, Kim and Kami up there to cherish the Ainu people and then provide them with all this abundance. That's basically what the idea is. But to the Japanese eyes, that's nothing but animal, <laughs> animal abuse. So, their tradition, one of them that was prohibited was Iomante, okay? Okay, the next one is, the hunting and gathering Ainu were advised to become farmers However, the land given to them was often not arable, 
the Ainu did not have a notion of private land ownership. Mm -hmm. So the Ainu people were encouraged to become farmers, but the land that they were given were the worst kind of land. They could not do anything about it. And then also, when you go to the mountains and then you would uh, develop the land, then you're given the land. But the interesting thing is, a lot of times the land that Ainu developed with hard work were often taken by the Japanese, and they didn't have any voice in that. Okay, the Ainu children had to go to Ainu schools to learn Japanese and ethics, moral education. The same was done in Okinawa, Taiwan, and Korea when Japan colonized them during World War II. Yeah, so history repeats itself, and it seems like some people never ever learn, and they keep doing all these kind of injustice and bad things because they are different. And uh, that's kind of universal, isn't it? Whatever we're talking about, okay? The last thing says, the act was repealed in 1997 and was replaced with the Ainu Cultural Promotion Act. Yeah, 1997, that's very recent, isn't it? Only in the last 25 years or so. You know, when you think about the long history of them. Okay. Okay, this is another list of dates. Um, the 1946, the Hokkaido, uh, the Hokkaido Ainu Association was established. 1986, the Prime Minister, Yoshihiro Nakasone, claimed that Japan is a homogenous nation. I think you just talk, told us about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 1992, Iichi Nomura, the head of the Hokkaido Ainu Association, gives a speech at the United Nations. 1994, Shigeru Kayano becomes the first Ainu National Assemblyman. 2007, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the Japanese government followed. Last is 2008, the National Diet unanimously recognizes the Ainu as the indigenous people of Japan. Mm -hmm. So, how long years ago was 2008? <laughs> I know, so it's, as, as you can see, the history of the Ainu, it's been a tough one, isn't it? When you think about it. But the Ainu people are not really uh, resentful about the past. You know, instead of just hanging on to the past and being unhappy about it, a lot of them say, I'm happy, I'm Ainu. And that is their strength that I find in themselves. Because a lot of times, you know, if I were them, I feel like I'm defeated. You know, whichever the direction you face, you know, people are nasty to you just because of what you look like or what you are. And um, there's discrimination going on and, uh, prejudice and everything else. And uh, it took them a long time to come this far, but they're not really sad or, or resentful. And I really, you know, like their energy and the power to keep going. And they're very optimistic about the future and so on. And that's one of the things that I want to feature in my next documentary film, because Hiroko, this Iron woman, she's very, very happy, perky, and. Uh, you know, she did have lots of obstacles and everything, but she, you know, covers, it. oh, you know, she, she's happy with whatever happened because she did her best dealing with all these kind of problems and so on. And that's with resilience, I guess, you know. So that, that's going to be next to Phil. Okay. And uh, these are the very new ones, okay. Okay, 2012, Shiro Kayano, Shigeru Kayano's son, established the Ainu Party. 2019, the Act on the Promotion of Ainu Culture, Dissemination, and Enlightenment of Knowledge about Ainu Traditions, etc., was enacted with measures to realize a society where the Ainu people are respected. The lack of information and knowledge about the Ainu leads to bullying, discrimination, ostracization, and exclusion of Ainu children in school and education. 2020, the first National Ainu Museum and Park opened in Shiraoi in Hokkaido. Uh -huh, and that's only three years ago, isn't it? But again, uh, this goes together with, uh, you know, the presentations before mine, that is, knowledge is power, 
So it is great to have that kind of national museum dedicated to that group. But at the same time, pictures can be, you know, um, uh, what should I say? Pictures can be not true, but you know, could be fakey, mis yeah, misrepresenting or something like that, right? So some of the Ainu people who did go to that museum said that there's not enough perspective from the Ainu people. So obviously since it is the National Museum, the opinions of the government or the bad things that the government did, a lot of them were kind of downplayed, obviously. You know, so, but I would recommend you to go to the National Museum. I haven't done it yet, but I went to the one, the previous version of the National uh, Museum in 2011. And uh, I think it is good that they do have that National Museum because it's better to have one than not have one, you know. And uh, regardless of the nature of information or presentation whatsoever, the information is there and you can gain knowledge about it. So I think that's the last uh, slide, isn't it? There's yeah, just about, yeah. Okay, you social read issues, read yeah. You can read this one? Okay. Yeah, let's just yeah. copy that real quick. Number one, poverty, 36.1% of the INU were on social welfare in 2017. Education, in 2013, 33.3% of INU attended junior, junior colleges and universities in Japan, while the number for the Y gene was 45.8%. Number three, lower income levels, bullying at work. Number four, discrimination, prejudice, bullying that take place at school and work. Five, marriage. Mm -hmm. And number six, alcoholism. I didn't write it down, but a lot of I am men especially, they drink a lot. <laughs> I think you kind of got the sense from my presentation. And actually, Mr. Uh, Kaizawa, Tomesan, told me, do you know what, you know, when the tigers die, they leave their skin, you know, the leather, the, what do you call it, the leather hide? Yeah, behind, so that the tigers, they have the life, and then even after their life, they are going to be useful. And so are other animals, you know, for example, I have a leather bag that used to be a cow's skin, okay? But he said, do you know what the Ainu people leave behind? So I said, heritage, you know, legends and so on, legacy. And then he says, no, bottles. <laughs> That's what he said. So. As you, as you look at these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and then as you listen to my story today, or presentation, you know some other groups of people who have similar experiences, don't you? Yeah, so the interesting thing is, and this is what I tell my students all the time, when we talk about things in Japan, good or bad, we think it's in you know, somewhere far away. But the interesting thing is, when you know things far away, a lot of times you can compare it with what's going on in your backyard and reflect upon it. And I think that is the very important thing about knowledge, information, and education. That is, you gain the information, knowledge, but you can kind of reflect on it, and then you can critically and I thought, and uh, I hope that if my presentation helped you to see yourself a little bit differently, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jen, for your help. Would you like to open it up for more questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I can read that, but it's because of the light that's, coming that's to my eyes. That's the same slide that was there. Sort of yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. So, if you do have any extra questions, you know, I can answer them, okay? And please feel free, any question is fine. Chris, he has a question, looks like. What do you mean by that? It's a... Some of the most rare an indigenous minority group is, they have an individual decision about the extent to which they are going to conform with the majority group or 
uh, stick with their heritage and culture and traditions. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about this in a comparison context between the United States and Japan. The United States is a highly individualistic society, whereas Japan is more collectivist. And I wonder if I wonder how that affects people's calculus when they're trying to decide how how much to assimilate. It's a really big question. Uh, a lot of people think that Japan is a collectivism or groupies of kind. Of so did I answer your question a little bit different and a little bit better than before? So in those days, the parental pressure used to be a lot bigger, you know, there, were, there was a lot of it. But nowadays, children, if they want to, like for example, if you do look like I am, and then you stand out, you know, physically speaking, like your eyebrows are very thick, for example, or you get um, longer nose or hairy. Hairiness is another thing too. You know, a lot of Ainu people have hairy um, bodies, okay? Very hairy, you know. And uh, so this Ainu girl told me that, you know, <laughs> we're talking about like hair on our arms. You know, I do have some, and then she said, I can beat you, or she said, you know. So certain physical characteristics we cannot hide, you know, and then people would react to us whether we like it or not. So if you stand out as an Ainu person in Hokkaido and then you're bullied and stuff like that, one of the choices are go to like metropolitan cities like Tokyo or Osaka, where there are lots of other people, including foreigners, and that way you do not really stand out. So there are a large number of Ainu people, population in the metropolitan areas, because they have easier time mingling in with the rest of the society instead of sticking out. And also there are certain parental pressures, but mostly these days, like people who are learning about embroideries or language, they can be both Ainu and non-Ainu. So it seems like it is up to the individual's discretion about learning certain things or not learning something. So it's really up to the individuals and just because you're an Ainu blood wise doesn't mean that you have to practice Ainu ways. So the 21st century is much better than the 20th or 19th centuries obviously because we have more choices and um, you know there are like Ainu musicians who are working internationally as well. You know and YouTube and other things so that they can, uh, you know, kind of disseminate information about themselves and so, so that there's more understanding. And there are followers of Japanese people who like Ainu culture, you know, food, uh, clothes, and uh, other things. So did I answer your question? Yeah. Is there anybody else? Well, I've got a thousand, but I'm not going to bother everybody here with them. Um, I will point out a couple of things, though, that I thought were particularly interesting. One is that they're teaching Esperanto there, and I would agree with the speaker who says everyone should learn Esperanto. It's a very easy language to learn, um, but that has nothing really much to do with your talk, but I was just fascinated that that was there. Yeah, and he was in his 80s when he said that, too. And the interesting thing is, language which speak which language you speak defines what kind of perspectives you have about your experiences and the world around you. And as you said, Jerry, Ainu and Japanese languages are not related. The Ainu language is considered isolate um, language, and uh, it doesn't have any kind of relations to any other languages. And what Mr. Nabisawa was saying is like so. You know, when we speak a certain language, the language itself already gives us this kind of way to look at the reality or slice the reality because of the language that you use. And that is why he said that Esperanto may be an, um, an answer to it. Mm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. This is <laughs> wonderful. And uh, I don't know what else to say. It's just, it's great. Yeah, I just hope that, you know, my presenters have to reflect upon your own life and then you can contribute to world peace 
you know, because when we're talking about respecting human rights, we start with ourselves, right? Don't neglect yourself. You know, you have to respect your own human rights first, and then you can try to understand other people and then be nice and so on. And uh, that's what I tell my students all the time too. Okay, we do talk about positives and negatives about certain things, and if we do not do anything on it, what is the purpose of education, right? You know. So as I did my research uh, about the Asian people, they taught me a lot. Not like the way that we teach at the university here, but by just associating with them, just interacting with them, just being together with them, you pick up a lot of things. And uh, so that's what I did, uh, staying with the Hiroko this last summer. So I'm going to make uh, another picture and how she sees the world and so on. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, there's another film on YouTube, the same title. Have you ever heard about, have you heard about the Ainu? But that one is 78 minutes, so you need a popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Supposed to mention yeah. upcoming events, yeah. which yeah. there are some, but unfortunately I don't have a list. I'm uh, supposed to request that you consider joining the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers if you're interested. Uh, there's information available on the website. Uh, always requesting that people consider being event hosts for a potluck, maybe a book club, families meet up, or something like that. And request for volunteers for many things, including presenting at these uh, sessions. We always have three short sessions, two or three, like Free Thought of the Day, Skeptical Sidebar, or The Member Story, but also if you know something that you feel like would be interesting to the group, maybe you could be the, the main presenter. And let me warn you, if we don't get volunteers, I'm going to volunteer next time to give everybody an hour on Esperanto, and I guarantee you I can talk longer about Esperanto than anyone in this room that wants to listen. Ask her if you want to know. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we will see you next time.